chapter number four. We'll begin there, but I hope you'll keep your Bibles open and we will turn to a couple of different places today. Uh, I believe this is what the Lord would have me to do. I had been preparing in preparation to continue our study uh, in the book of Acts, and I was looking forward to that. And then last night when I received the call to come over to the hospital, uh, I began to meditate about some other things and put a whole outline together for our lesson today. Then I got home last night and stayed up probably till about two in the morning, and the Lord just kept working on another thought in my mind. And I, I just feel like this is where we're supposed to be. And so I hope you will pray for me today as we study just a little bit from the Word of God. I know this is familiar. Uh, we're looking at the chapter about the rapture. And I, you say, well, I've heard everything there is to be said about the rapture. Well, you're going to hear it again. So let's look here in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. And I want us to look here in verse number 13. And you know these verses. I know you probably haven't memorized. If you don't, I hope you will memorize them. For the Bible says in verse number 13 of the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, or in that sense is speaking about death. It's not talking about soul sleep. Uh, you understand that. Concerning uh, them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise First, Now somebody might have the question, why are the dead going to rise first? Um, uh, Dr. Aiken told me one day, and he's buried, I believe, over 800 and something people uh, uh, during his ministry. He said the dead will rise first. The reason for that is because they, they're below the ground about six feet. They need a head start to catch up with us. So I believe that's a good explanation of that. But look at verse 17. Then we which are alive. And remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. I want us to recognize verse number 13 this morning specifically. Where the Bible says, but I would, ha would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. One of the greatest causes of sorrow is when one of our loved ones or one of our dear friends passes away, can be broken down to one thing. It's a simple explanation, and that is that we have a lack of knowledge concerning death. You understand that the 66 books in your Bible have one center theme. We could say that is Jesus Christ, and you wouldn't be wrong to say that. But really, the 66 books of your Bible deal with one major theme, and that is the subject of eternity. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, as we have read, said, I would not have you to be ignorant. But I'm finding today we have a lot of Christians that are, uh, even on the subject of which we would deal with today. The chief cause of sorrow when we lose our loved ones is often because of a lack of knowledge. People have questions. Why did God allow this? What will heaven be like? Will we know one another in heaven? Uh, what will my mansion look like? What will our bodies be like? People have all kinds of questions. Will we be like angels? Uh, oh, what, where's my loved one going when they die? A lot of questions happen when you start to think about eternity especially when it involves a loved one or it involves a friend. But I want to ask a rather large question this morning, and that is a question I'm sure we've all asked one another, and that question is, will we know one another in heaven? Now, as I spoke just a moment ago, there's a lot I didn't know about our dear friend, Brother Tim, until last night. I'm sure there's a lot I didn't know, and I will probably not ever know. 
And just like some of you may say you know me, but do you really know me? Do I really know you? We, we wonder here on earth, do we know one another, but yet we have this idea, uh, well, I want to know everybody up in heaven. That's a good thing. But we barely know one another, each other down here. But I really, really want us to focus on that thought. Will we know one another in heaven? Now, I can give you the answer right up front and go ahead and tell you the answer is simply yes. We will know one another in heaven. But I want to give you more of an explanation of that answer. If you were to turn to the book of Luke, in chapter number 13, verse number 18, you'll find that the Bible describes that we shall see Abraham, we shall see Isaac, we shall see Jacob, and we will see all of the prophets of the kingdom of God. God makes it very clear that we are going to know these men and many others that we have read about in the Bible. You remember there in the Mount of Transfiguration that they recognize Moses and they recognize Elijah. Let me remind you, Moses and Elijah did not know each other. They did not live at the same time. But yet they definitely knew one another when they were there on the Mount of Transfiguration as they referred to one another and said, How are you doing, Moses? Elijah said, I'm doing great. Hey, Elijah, how, how was Mount Carmel as they began to talk? They knew one another. But how are we supposed to know one another in heaven? I believe we are going to know one another. But we need to know some things first. And one of those things is we need to first understand something about our earthly bodies. Go with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. We need to understand that we have earthly bodies. Earthly bodies. If you will look today in verse uh, number uh, 43, look at verse uh, 43. Actually, let's start at verse 40. The Bible says, There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and the other glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in the corruption, it is raised in corruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. So that tells me two things right there. There is a natural body, there is a spiritual body. There's difference there. We need to understand that. Verse 44, there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. He's repeating himself. When the Bible repeats itself, you better pay close attention to what it's about to say. Verse 45, and so it is written that the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not the first which is spiritual, but that which is the natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. And the second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. <laughs> we shall not all sleep. We shall not all die. But we shall all be changed. Oh, isn't that a wonderful thing? Not all of us are going to die, but we all will be changed one glorious day. What a great truth in one verse. We could spend there a moment, but I like verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. 
So when the corruptible shall have put on incorruption and the mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought the past the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But verse 57, hallelujah, Miss Posey, you get on this with me this morning. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ therefore my beloved brethren be ye steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I want us to consider for a moment, and I know we're reading a lot of scripture this morning, but I want you to understand what I'm going to say today is not my opinion, is not my words, but is coming from the precious word of God. I want us to understand our earthly bodies. We'll never understand the heavenly things until we first understand the earthly things. You know, all of us have a earthly mind, a mind that may not be the smartest. And looking at some, I can say that's probably true. But I also see that when I look in the mirror too, that we all wish we could be just a little bit smarter. But we currently have earthly minds. We have an earthly appearance some of us uh, have um, uh, facial hair. Some of us do not. Some of us have hair and some of us do not. Some of us uh, have wrinkles and some of us do not. We all have an earthly appearance, but how did this come to be? Well, in the beginning, God. God created the heavens and the earth. And on that sixth day, God created a man. And his name was Adam. Adam was the first man and he was created in the image of God. Adam was a great man. Oh, he was one that was able to walk with the Lord in the garden all by himself with sweet fellowship. But God thought to himself that a man is not good without a woman. Isn't that the truth? He needed a wife and he put him to sleep. And he woke up the next day and he found the most beautiful woman on the earth. She was the only woman on the earth. And he said, man, I'm missing something in my side. It feels like my ribs are missing. I wonder what had happened. Well, we know the story and where it ended up. The serpent came and the serpent tempted old Eve. And Eve took of the fruit to which she should not have. Oh, that was bad enough. But you know, we are not condemned because of Eve. We are condemned because of Adam. Eve went to her husband and asked of him to also take part in eating of that fruit, which God was very clear, don't eat that fruit. We don't know if it was an apple. We don't know if it was an orange. We don't know if it was a fruit that even exists today. But regardless what it was, God made a very clear command. Do not take of that fruit. But Adam had to make a choice. Just like all of us have to make a choice. We are, all, we are either going to obey God or we are going to follow our flesh. He was either going to obey God and follow God or he was going to love his wife and take part in living with her and forgetting God. And he chose to go with Eve. He loved her so much. And yes, that's a great love. But my, when you start putting somebody above God, you've got a problem. And he knew the consequences of that. And of course, the very moment he bit of that fruit... They recognize, hey, it's a little chilly in here. Hey, it feels like we're missing something on our bodies we ought to probably have. And they began to find some fig leaves and they began to cover up their sin. You know, when we start to recognize that we've done something against God, we're just like Adam and Eve and we begin to try to cover it up. By the way, you ought not to try to cover it up the more you cover it up, the bigger it'll get, the bigger explosion it will, and it will affect you and others more in greater ways. Adam tried covering up his own sin, but God knew where he was. 
God came and looking for Adam and found him in fig leaves. But out of the mercies of God, God killed a lamb that day and clothed them in his, uh, in this wool. Blood was shed for that day. That blood didn't have to be shed, but here's the problem. Adam had something that we all have today now. We all have been given a sickness. We've all been diagnosed with a sickness today. It's a little three-letter word known as sin. S-I-N. And because of sin, you and I face judgment. You know, there was a day where you could go outside in the days of Adam in those early years. We don't know how long they were in the garden exactly, but we know for a good period of time. But they never sweated. Imagine that. They didn't sweat one little bit. I don't know about you, but as it gets hotter, my goodness, that humidity will get to you and you're just sweat all over. There was times that they could go to the garden and there was no weeds. Wouldn't that be nice to have? But you know, there's more than just consequences of what has affected our earth with thorns and thistles. But the sickness has affected us. It's affected our bodies. And the reason that we have to get glasses. The reason that we have back problems, the reason things such as uh, cancer or things such as COVID or such as these diseases that have come into this earth all come back down to this three little word known as sin. And it all started in the day of Adam all those years ago in the Garden of Eden. We have sinful Bodies. We have sick bodies. Some of us, it's hard even to come to church, especially on a rainy Sunday, because we're scared. Uh, we might fall. Uh, we might slip. Oh my, we wake up in the morning and our back is hurting just a little bit much. Oh, our eyes are not what they used to be. I used to be a strong man. I used to be a strong woman. Oh, you couldn't tell me not to do that. I was going to do it anyway. But you know as time has went on and as we've grown, well, you can't do that now. Why? Because of sin. Our bodies are corruptible. They're corruptible, they're filthy, they're nasty. All because of a man known as Adam. Now I want you to understand something very clear that this morning. There are only two places a Christian can never be. And I hope you'll write this down. Two places a Christian can never be. That is in the body and or with the Lord. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. In the book of Philippians 1 23, Paul said, I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Now, when someone dies, and their body is laid in front of us, in front of this pulpit. They're not there. They're with the Lord. That is just their temple. You know what you and I are in right now? We're in a temple. This is something we have on this earth. We claim it as ours. This body is not us. You understand that, right? Right? There's the body, there's the soul, and there's the spirit. Now we are not a spirit, but we are a soul, but we have a spirit. But we don't go and say that we are going to take our body to heaven. No, our body stays here for a period of time. We'll get our bodies back someday, but it's just something that we own just like when you hurt your big toe, you don't say, I hurt. No, you say, my big toe hurts. When your hair gets a little lit long, you don't say, I need, a, I need a cut. No, you say, I need my hair cut. 
Because it's something that you own. It's your body. Just as you own a jacket. That's my jacket. That's my cane. That's my tie. That's my car. That's my house. That's something that we own. The bodies of which we have this morning are something that we own right now. But one day these bodies will die. One day these bodies will return back to where they came from. And they will return back to dust. When that body lays in front of us, whether it's a family member, whether it's a friend, they're not there. That's just something that was borrowed for a time. Their soul and their spirit is in a different destination. I was so privileged last night to be able to speak with Miss Sharon. And I began to ask her, I had not got to ask Brother Tim personally, and I was hoping back in March when we were doing our testimonies during our Sunday school hour, I could get Brother Tim to share his testimony, but because of his health, we never were able to do it. But I asked Miss Sharon to share a little bit of his testimony last night. Miss Sharon and Brother Tim both got saved at later in their life, at the age, I believe, 35, if I understand correctly. Miss Sharon got saved first. Uh, she was actually going down to the altar with her daughter who was needed to be saved. And we, she didn't get saved that night, but Miss Sharon got in. Her daughter got saved later. Miss Sharon got a burden for her husband. And as they were driving down the road one day, Miss Sharon began to lead Brother Tim to Christ as they drove down the road. She got a burden. And by the way, when somebody gets saved, you get a burden to lead somebody to Christ. Miss Sharon got a burden for Brother Tim, and Brother Tim got born again on the road. And from that point forward, Brother Tim, he went around and he went to churches and he wanted to learn more about the Word of God. I tell you what, I've only known Brother Tim a short while, but every time I met Brother Tim, he loved the church, he loved his pastor, he loved the Bible, and if he wasn't here, he was complaining that he wasn't doing something. He wanted to count the money. He, he wanted to do something. If, the, if any, he, there were many times uh, that I would come out here and he would run off to Burger King and bring me back a Whopper. He didn't have to do that. But you know why he did? He had an attitude. He had the character of a servant. You know where that came from? Jesus Christ. But before Brother Tim got saved, he didn't have such. You won't have such without Jesus Christ. You know, our earthly bodies are all against everybody. That's why we see what we're seeing in our generation. Why we're seeing kids kill other kids, classmates. Why we're seeing the bloody wars that are going on in these days is because we are all about ourselves. But when we accept Christ, our lives begin to reflect Jesus Christ and we begin to love others and just want to serve others. Our earthly bodies are sick because of one man. And because of that one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin came. Sin is leading all of us slowly to the grave. One of the most joyful days in our lives is when we go into the hospital and we meet that young mother as she holds that little newborn baby. We all smile and we all laugh and we're so excited for the future of that little child. Now, I'll go ahead and go on record here. I've never seen a newborn baby that was gorgeous. I don't know where all of y'all are getting that. Give it a few days. But it's a beautiful thing to see the birth of a child. But don't you know and understand that when that baby's in that arm of that mother, it's now just a slow timer towards the death of that child. Why? Because of sin. S-I-N. Sin is all going to lead us to the grave because a price must be paid because of our sin. It's the wages of sin is death. Adam, he caused sin to come on us. And we all have sin. And according to Psalm 51 verse 5, we were conceived into sin. And when we think about will we know one another in heaven, we need to understand that these bodies are only temporal. But I want us to notice real quickly as we close, I want us to think about our eternal 
bodies for just a moment. Our eternal bodies. The Bible says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that our bodies are corrupt are corrupted. But someday we will inherit incorruption. Now how is our body going to be incorruptible? How is our body going to be powerful? Right now, many of our bodies are weak and many are very frail. How many people I've spoken to at the radio station on the way of telephone that are bedridden? They're weak. They can't do anything. But yet the Bible says that one day they're going to be powerful. They're going to be strong. Their bodies are going to be stronger than any 20-year-old that they could think of. Their body is going to be glorious, just like our Savior, Jesus Christ. You're not going to have a body like an angel. I don't know where we got that concept, but our bodies will be like Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ knows all things. We'll have a mind like Christ one day. We'll have power like Christ. We won't be as powerful, but you understand what I mean. We're having mortar bodies. You remember when Jesus, after the resurrection, when he went through the wall and he scared the apostles half to death. We're going to have those kind of bodies one day in heaven. Oh, gravity won't be able to hold us down. We'll be having a great old time there on Hallelujah Boulevard. But you understand that this morning, you won't have that eternal body without Jesus Christ. You can't go to heaven unless you're one of his sons. You can't go to heaven unless you're one of his daughters. You must come by the son and his name is Jesus Christ. There's one way to heaven and it's by Jesus Christ. If you're going to look like Jesus, you have to come by Jesus. If we're going to be as powerful as Jesus, you have to come by Jesus. And if we're going to spend all of eternity in heaven, why would you not want to be uh, with Jesus now? Oh, it's so sweet. It's so sweet to know Jesus this morning. And I know last night as we sat around that bed and we sat around that lifeless body of me and Miss Sharon and her family and her friends as we began to rejoice in the Lord knowing that this is just goodbye See you later. There's going to be a casket laid in front of us in just a few days, but that's not the last time. That's just a hope chest. That's all that is. One day we'll see Brother Tim again. I'm telling you that this morning, Brother Tim, he's running around. He's not hurting anymore. He's not having any pain anymore. He's shouting the victory all over. Oh my, if he could say one thing this morning to everybody in this room today, he would say, oh, why don't you know Jesus today? Oh, I'm telling you, that's the one prayer coming from heaven and coming from hell. There are family members, there are friends that are praying for you to know Jesus Christ. You know, you'll never know, Brother Tim, again until you know Jesus Christ. We won't know one another. We won't know one another in heaven if we don't know Jesus Christ first. We never will. But oh, what a meeting. They're in the skies. No tears, no crying shall dim our eyes. Loved ones eternally, oh, what daybreak the morning will be. Some golden daybreak, Jesus will come. Some golden daybreak, battles are all won. He'll shout the victory, break through the blue. Some golden daybreak for me and for you. These bodies, oh, they're corruptible but right now. But one day, the trumpet of the Lord shall sound. We won't have hurting backs anymore, Miss Peggy. We won't have hurting feet anymore. That cancer that's in our bodies, it will be God. We'll put off this corruptible body. We'll have an incorruptible body. Oh, I'm telling you this morning, oh, for the, our loved ones, they're having a great old time. We may have saw them on that bed and they were hurting and they were in pain. We saw tears come from their eyes, but they're not crying anymore. They're not, they're shouting today and one day you and I will be shot alongside them. We'll be running around the streets with them that maybe we never were able to do. Oh, how many people I've met, they were born crippled. But one day they'll be walking. 
I've met people that are deaf, but one day they're going to be able to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. There have been many like Freddie Cosby and others that were blind because of circumstances, but when they opened their eyes for the first time, they saw Jesus Christ. Oh, what a day, what a day it's going to be when we get to heaven and be with our Lord and be with our Savior. But we must understand that this morning in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, there's some ignorance. There are many ignorant about will we know one another in heaven. Go back with me to 1 Thessalonians 4 real quickly. I want to just give you some practical advice here over these next few days. Practical advice that I think will be a great help if maybe I can find 1 Thessalonians 4. That would be nice. <clears throat> I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Notice that last phrase, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. The Bible doesn't say sorrow not. It says sorrow not even as others which have no hope. When our loved ones go, when our friends go sorrow, it's okay. It's okay. If tears come, it's okay. It doesn't say we're not going to have sorrow. We ought to expect there will be sorrow and perhaps even lots of it. It's not going to get easier. I've already made up in my calendar for next year to go ahead and prepare. You know it's always harder the year after. And I hope we'll make plans for that. But let us help remember our promise that we've been given. One day this corruptible body will put on incorruption. One day we will go to a place called heaven. And we will have a mansion that God has prepared for you and I. We will see not only our grandmother, we only, we'll not only see our grandpa, we'll see our mother, we'll see our father, we'll see our brothers and sisters and friends that have gone on, but most of all, we'll get to see the one who hung upon the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. Let me read this poem and then we'll dismiss. It was written by Marvin Lewis. It's titled, Looking Ahead. It goes a little something like this. This old life is filled with sorrows, filled with heartaches, pains, and fears. Here we have our disappointments, cheeks are lined and with bitter tears. But our Father, God in heaven, longs to help us overcome. Then when the short life is ended, he will take us safely home. Yes, our lives may be all gloomy, clouds may shadow every day. But we understand it better when the midst are all rolled away. When the Savior comes to take us to the land of rest up there, we'll forget the disappointments which were here so hard to bear. So let's think of God in heaven. Let's look up and laugh and smile and forget our disappointments. We will be leaving in a while. For that home to be with Jesus, for that home so bright and fair, for that land that's filled with gladness, we will find no sorrow there. Jesus is coming. And one day these bodies will say bye-bye. They won't, they'll be changed one day. But will we know one another in heaven? Will we know Brother Tim in heaven? You won't unless you know Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Have you considered eternity this morning? I hope you will right now. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the promises of which you've given to us in thy word about heaven, our home. Lord, we're so thankful for the word of God and we're so thankful for your son and his sacrifice. Lord, we don't deserve, Lord, anything except to go to a place called hell. But Lord, out of thy mercy and out of thy grace, Lord, you came and bore our sin for us. Oh, we're so thankful. And we're so thankful to know that our dear friend is in heaven today. And we know he's having a wonderful time. Now God, I pray, Lord, 
that everybody that knows Brother Tim, his family, his friends, will get to know him again in heaven. And I pray, God, that you may use his life and his testimony, Lord, to be used of the Lord in these days. And I pray, God, that you may help us be encouraged not to look at the earthly things, but, Lord, help us this morning and help us this week, Lord, to focus upon the heavenly things. Oh, these bodies may ache. Lord, that we may have disappointments, but God, all of that will be over, and it could be over before we even leave this place. Lord, I'm looking, I'm listening for that trumpet. I believe it's coming. Lord, there's nothing in the Word of God that I can find that says you couldn't come right now. God, we're looking, we're waiting, and God, I'm praying that you will come today.